This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Bolshevik Myth by Alexander Berkman Chapter 27 Further South August 7, 1920 Slowly our train creeps through the country, evidence of devastation on every hand, reminding us of the long years of war, revolution, and civil strife. The towns and cities on our route look poverty-stricken. The stores are closed, the streets deserted. By degrees, Soviet conditions are being established, the process progressing more rapidly in some places than in others. In Poltava we find neither Soviet nor Ipsolkom, the usual form of Bolshevik government. Instead, the city is ruled by the more primitive Revkom, the self-appointed revolutionary committee, active underground during white regimes and taking charge whenever the Red Army occupies a district. Kremenchug and Znamenka present the familiar picture of the small southern town, with a little marketplace still suffered by the Bolsheviki, the center of its commercial and social life. In uneven rows, the peasant women sprawl on sacks of potatoes or squat on their haunches, exchanging flour, rice and beans for tobacco, soap and salt. Soviet money is scorned, hardly anyone accepting it, though Tsarkia are in demand and occasionally Karenki are favored. The entire older population of the city seems to be in the market, everyone bargaining, selling or buying. Soviet militionary, guns slung across the shoulder, circulate among the people, and here and there a man in leather coat and a cap is conspicuous in the crowd, a communist or a Czechist. The people seem to shun them, and conversation is subdued in their presence. Political questions are avoided, but lamentation over the terrible situation is universal. Everyone complaining about the insufficiency of the piok, the irregularity of its issue, and the general condition of starvation and misery. More frequently we meet men and women of a Jewish type. The look of the hunted in their eyes, and more dreadful, become the stories of pogroms that had taken place in the neighborhood. Few young persons are visible. These are in the Soviet institutions, working as the employees of the government. The young women we meet occasionally have a startled, frightened look, and many men bear ugly scars on their faces, as is from a saber or sword cut. In Znamenka, Henry Alsberg, the American correspondent, accompanying our expedition, discovers the loss of his purse, containing a considerable amount of foreign money. Inquiries of the peasant women in the market place elicit only a shrewdly naive smile, with a resentful exclamation, How do I know? Visiting the local police station in the faint hope of advice or aid, we learn that the whole force has just been rushed off to the environs reported to be attacked by a company of Mahnudzi. Despairing of recovering our loss, we return to the railroad station. To our astonishment, the museum car is nowhere to be seen. In consternation, we, le we learn that it was coupled to a train that started for Kiev via Fostov an hour ago. We realize the seriousness of our predicament in being stranded in a city without hotels or restaurants and with no food to be purchased for Soviet money, the only kind in our possession. While discussing the situation, we observe a military supply train in slow motion on a distant siding. We dash forward and succeed in boarding it at the cost of a few scratches. The commissar in charge at the first strenuously objects to our presence, at no pains to hide the suspicions aroused by our sudden appearance. It requires considerable argument and much demonstration of official documents before the bureaucrat is mollified. Over a cup of tea, he begins to thaw out, the primitive hospitality of the Russian helping to establish friendly relations. Before long, we are deep in the discussion of the revolution and current problems. Our host is a communist from the masses, as he terms it. He is a great admirer of Trotsky and his iron broom methods. Revolution can conquer only by the generous use of the sword, he believes. Morality and sentiment are bourgeois superstitions. His conception of socialism is puerile. His information about the world at large of the scantiest. His arguments echo the familiar editorials of the official press. He is confident the whole of Western Europe is soon to be aflame with revolution. The Red Army is even now before the gates of Warsaw, he asserts, about to enter and to assure the triumph of the Polish proletariat risen against its masters. Late in the afternoon we reach Fastov, and are warmly welcomed by our colleagues of the expedition, who had spent anxious hours over our disappearance.
This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.